Hey everybody, welcome back, and I am your host, Joe J.D. Foster, and today I'm going to discuss the, my choice of the top 10 sports urban legends. Now, I tried to find a range in these from the NFL to boxing and anywhere else, and find ones that sounded like they could be believable, and might actually be true after all, whether they are. <laughs> even though right now they're just unconfirmed. So let's just, and there's one of these that really matters to me because if it turns out that's true, it would break my heart. But, I mean, well, it's part true, but it has some basis in it that proves otherwise. So anyways, let's begin with Let's start with the list. Number one on the list, Broadway Joe's Deal with the Devil. Super Bowl three. the Jets were going into it, and one night, Joe Namath is out at a bar drinking. A man comes up to him, tells him he'll offer him anything in exchange for his soul. Well, apparently, Joe's drinking gets to him, and he decides to take him another drink, and offers up instead an action that states that not only will he accept if he sell his soul, but he will also be okay with the Jets never winning another Super Bowl if he gets a soup if he is able to win Super Bowl three. Well, the deal's made that they win then the Jets will never win another one as long as Joe Namath is alive. Is it possible that Joe actually made the deal with the true devil and has a future of looking forward to whatever punishment comes with it? Or is it just coinc or is it just by chance that the Jets have had bad seasons since then and not able to win one when it Guess we'll find out when Joe finally kicks the bucket. Number two on the list, Sonny Liston, Muhammad Ali, the Phantom Punch. Now what makes this one so controversial is that Muhammad Ali had been bragging all the way up to the fight. And he told him, even in an interview, that if he told him what he'd done in an interview, you know, what he was going to do in the fight, they wouldn't show up to it to see how he beats Liston. Well, the day of the fight, the fight started, and within minutes, the match was over when Muhammad Ali throws a punch. I watched video of this fight. Well, the problem is, it took me time to notice it, but if you watch it, this phantom punch, as they're describing it, is Muhammad Ali throwing a punch that many claim doesn't actually connect, while others, who saw the same thing I did, See that it connects, but doubt the amount of force that would be behind it would actually have been enough to knock Liston down. Now, whether it was just a luck, now whether it was just the way it looked and the punch was actually more powerful or not, the fact is the match was ended and Muhammad Ali won. Well, many, like I said, many claim that the punch never touched him. Others claim that the punch wasn't strong enough to knock out a boxer. Then there's those who claim that Muhammad Ali was alright, but Sonny Liston actually threw the fight because the mob got involved. And if the mob had gotten involved, the only reason I can think of that they did it was for this wonderful thing. Money. And they did it because of the odds. Sonny Liston was heavily Facts are that Sonny Liston was heavily favored in this fight. And so, putting their money on Muhammad Ali and having him win when everybody else was betting on Liston only raised those odds. And that means a bigger payout when they did it. Now for the fun one, and I'm sorry I'm going to mispronounce this person's last name in the process. Elvis Stojo, I mean Stoko, Pummels Eric Lindros. 
Elvis is a five, I mean, was a five seven, hundred fifty six pound figure skater, who supposedly, according to the story, took down the six four, two hundred and thirty seven pounder um, from the NHL Philadelphia Flyers, Eric Lindros. At the time this story takes place. Not only did he take him down, he apparently beat him with ease. And there's actually no idea where this story originated, though a lot of them are saying that it comes from the fact that Lindros was having legal problems at the time. Over the fact that in a bar, he had poured beer over a woman and spit in her mouth. And also the story of him being a, brawl, a bar brawler by reputation. But what makes this story funny is that Elvis and Lindros are best friends in real life, and they will laugh about this rumor and joke about it even. For as funny as it is to them. Because they don't know where it got started at either. Now for number four, God phoned Reggie White. And Reggie White, when he came out of college, was a top prospect. But, instead of going to the NFL, like a lot of players do, he went to what was then known as the United States Football League, a big competitor against the NFL. And he played for them until Donald Trump, yes, that, he, I mean, yes, that man we all know, would put them out of business. And then he would play for the Philadelphia Eagles for eight seasons. Until 1993, when he, when him and a handful of people, players came and pursued a landmark lawsuit, which created the unrestricted free agency. When this happened, he went and checked out Green Bay on a whim. But he wasn't thinking it was for him because it was small, cold, and the franchise wasn't known to spend much on its players. But... He still ended up there until he retired. And many may be asking why. Well, the rumor goes, I mean, well, the urban legend goes that he gave an interview, that when he was interviewed about where he was going to go, he stated he would go where God told him. Coach Holgram of Green Bay called him up and said, this is God. Come to Green Bay. Given he left it on his as a message, but and that's how he came to be there. Well, what's interesting is Coach Holgram claims that this is true and that it did happen. But Reggie White has never been able to confirm it, which is what makes it the urban legend that it is. Now for the fun one. Michael Jordan's gambling debt. This one I did not know about. But it does make a lot of sense. Okay, during Jordan's first retirement, he went to play baseball. And then he would return a year later. Or he would return later on. And when another three feet with the Bulls. But during the first time it was occurring, it turns out that there was a secret reason that the, according to the urban legend, that the true reason behind it was Jordan had developed, that Jordan had a gambling problem and he had amassed a major debt and he had went against the NBA's code, I mean rules. But rather than risking a backlash, as well as being embarrassed and having the face of the NBA at the time being embarrassed, they instead allowed him to do this retirement where he would where he'd serve out a suspension. And some places listed instead of as a ban, which is what it would have been. Otherwise, some places listed it as it would have been known as an extended suspension. But in order to avoid doing that, they allowed Jordan to disguise it as a retirement so he could serve out the sentence and they could save face and not get backlash from fans and viewers uh, that love the sport of basketball. 
Now, whether it's true or not is questionable as nobody has confirmed or denied it. But, one thing about it that makes it to where it might have some sequence of truth to it, at least the gambling part, is that Jordan is known to have gambled a lot on the golf course and at one point having to have paid off $57,000 to a person on a bet he made. Now for number six on the list, 1985's in a, I mean, NBA draft fit being fixed, aka the frozen envelope. The New York Knicks during the 70s were a big powerhouse, but in the early, early 80s, they started to drop. By the mid 80s, they were basically unknown. Well, I mean, they were basically ghosts of their former selves. They had managed to get the number one draft pick in the league. And at the same time, the number one prospect in the country was Patrick Ewing. For those of you who see this that don't know who that is, look it up on YouTube in basketball games. Trust me, you will love what you see because this guy could dunk, he could pose, I mean, he could shoot, he could block. He was a great ball player. Especially when he came out early. But anyways, supposedly, the person that was doing the draw for this had either bent the envelope tip or he had actually completely frozen it so that he would know who the envelope containing Patrick Ewing was. And when they did this, I mean, in order to get the number one draft pick, well, Ewing was going to be number one. They knew this. Whoever got it. Well, when they did it, the person went in to his nice little thing that they have and he drew out the frozen envelope as it's called, as it's been called in the conspiracy. And it's become, and it contained the New York Knicks name. So they got Patrick Ewing because of that. Now for number seven on the list, the Michael Jordan hangover game, aka the flu game. Shortly before game five of the NBA Finals, against the Jazz. This was during the second three-peat that Jordan had when he had Rodman and Pippen on his team. Jordan came down with flu-like symptoms suddenly and he also had dehydration issues. Yet, he scored 38 points including a three-pointer with 25 seconds left in order to win the game. For a person who was supposedly so ill, he played really well throughout that game. But alternate theories have, I mean, including by players who saw these games or were there, have come forward, including Jordan was actual. Okay, the common theory that comes from this, the conspiracy theory, is that Jordan actually had a hangover. Which is why they call it the hangover game. The players that have seen it have often said that what he had, where it was like flu symptoms, things like that, the majority of them are claiming that it seemed more like he had food poisoning during the game and still played. And then there's also the gambling theorists who were, who's said that Jordan was paid to play badly that game. And I hate to tell them, if that's true, that was not playing badly. And also, there's my theory. As much as I would like to have it be that Jordan had a hangover, or that he had food poisoning, I think that was just Jordan having an off night. And it sucks, because I liked the Jazz so much, and I wanted them to win that when I was watching the games. 
Now on to number eight. LeBron James leaving Cleveland. The real reason he went to Miami. LeBron James, when he came out, he was a big star at Cleveland. And he was loved. However, he would eventually leave for Miami, and it didn't make a lot of sense. Well, this is where the urban legend comes in. The urban legend is Delonte West and LeBron James were, big, were best friends. Well, eventually, LeBron found out that Delonte and his mother, Delonte and LeBron's mother had had sex. The two got into a fight, and LeBron got traded to Miami in order to separate from them, and he still has trouble with the issue. As it is. Well, at least that's the urban legend. But, again, it's never been confirmed or denied. Uh, the idea. Though, Delonte, if you watch the, um, I think it's Mojo's Top 10 on this, actually has Delonte in a video where he says something that deals with LeBron's mother, or talks about sex with LeBron's mother, but it's not like anything explicit, but it's making like, but it sounds more like a joking matter. Okay, number nine. And one of the biggest urban legends of them all, Babe Ruth, calling his shot. Now see, this one I argue with calling it an urban legend. Because I don't think it's that. I think it's that Babe actually, I think it's that Ruth actually knew what he was doing. Now, whether he got lucky on exactly where the shot went, or he just had a general idea of where it was going, that's a different story. But all we have is a grainy photo of him aiming the bat toward an area where the flag was. Well, the thing is, when he hit the ball, it went to that exact spot. So, how did he know? Was it... Some have theorized that he had a corked bat, so he knew when he hit the ball where it was going to go. Some have argued that he got the pitcher to throw him that exact pitch that he needed in order to hit it that way. And some believe, like I do, that he actually could feel it. Hitting, that he had such an intensity and passion for the game that he could read the pitcher. And when he knew where the pitch was going, and he knew what the pitch was, you could tell also by the wind when it was blowing, the feel of the air, where it was going exactly, I mean, where the ball would move to. And he's not the only person that they say this happens with in the sport of baseball, but he is the one that at this moment it would have affected. But I agree with also with a lot of people. It would have been nice if we had a video recording of this rather than just the grainy photo that we're that we know of. Number ten, the Steelers franchise was bought with winnings at a horse track. Art Rooney, the owner of the Steelers, was known for being a horse a horse track gambler. Well, that was never questioned until recently by the NFL because of their strict policy against gambling. But Art Rooney has never confirmed that was how he got the money for the I mean, for the team. And personally, if he's smart, he'll he won't confirm he won't confirm it either. And he also won't have a paper trail sometimes that'll lead to it. Number 11, and now we go to pro wrestling, the WCW Scissors Incident. Um, professional wrestlers Psycho Sid Vicious, Arn Anderson, and Ric Flair were at a bar one night. Sid 
and all of them had been drinking, and Sid told them they needed to retire because he was the future. Him and Anderson got into an argument, which led to a fight. Flair eventually broke him up, took Arn back to his room. Sid later went to Arn, later went to Arn Anderson's room, and they continued their fight. Sometime during the fight, though, Sid would draw Sid would draw an actual pair of scissors on and on Arn and stab him in the back multiple times. Sid would run away. Arn was taken to the hospital, but Sid was later arrested for his actions. Though, apparently it didn't stick, or he didn't get much of a sentence for it. Uh, what I originally had is number 12. I mean, what I originally left out, I'm now going to include is number 12. And that's the Ultimate Warrior having died in 1991. Now, this is the biggest urban legend of them all in pro wrestling. In professional wrestling. The original Warrior, after SummerSlam 1991, left the company, now known as WWE, supposedly due to contractual issues with Vince McMahon. But when they did this, Vince had an issue. Well, Supposedly, while he was away, the warrior died. I mean, the real Ultimate Warrior died. And Vince, wanting to not have that continue and not have it end, having seen the money made off of it, came up with the idea to just replace him with a new warrior. And that's who we've seen. That's who we'd seen all this time. That it wasn't the original Ultimate Warrior. That the one that we had come to know for all this time was actually the second. Now that one I have to disagree with. Because I think those people were just really out there. And just really wanting to reach for something. Now for number 13 on the list. And this one is the one that's the most personal to me. And that is the Black Sox scandal of 1919. World Series, where, okay, in this time, players were known to be underpaid because they had a reserve clause, which meant they couldn't switch teams without the owner's permission. No union reps. And gamblers would find players who wanted to make extra money and pay them to either lose games or to throw them in some way so that they could make money. Well, in the 1919 World Series, it was the White Sox versus the Reds. Cincinnati Reds. The White Sox were heavy favorites. Rumors spread, went, and so some people came up to the White Sox, said, hey, we'll pay you to throw these games. Well, it was shown that they did accept the money, but it was never proven that they actually threw the games during that time. Well, when game day came, the odds started rising against I mean, the odds for the Reds to win started being, started dropping. I mean, started working in favor of the Red, I mean, of the Reds, which raised suspicion. But, this was because they, rumors had started flying that the White Sox had agreed to throw, in the, ga to throw the games. A number of correspondents had caught wind of this. And were actually had actually decided they were going to keep track of every game and prove it whether it was true or not. The gamblers, after a bit though, back then it was a best of nine series rather than now where it's a best of seven. Well, after game four, the gamblers who had started and who had promised to pay the players after the games. We're now attempting to back out of their deals. So the players got angry and they attempted to double cross them by winning and evening out the series. Well, game eight came along and threats of violence were made against the players by the gamblers. Before their final loss, though, as the White Sox would go on to lose game eight 
and that would end the series for them. Well, when it happened, the final loss, the players that had been paid had each been paid $5,000, which, which as of 2019 would have resulted in $74,000. With the exception of the person the gamblers had initially come to, who got the price of $35,000, totaling out to $516,000 in 2019. The players were taken to court over what they'd done. Prosecution could never fully prove, some say at all, that they threw the games. However, they did prove, <coughs> and, and one example of this is Sheila Show Jackson's record during the game. I mean, during the series, as during the entire series, he actually played better than he had most of the season. And since they took the money, they were found guilty of committing a crime. As, and their punishment for it was the eight people involved in it were banned from ever playing baseball anywhere again. And they were banned from the Hall of Fame. Many would try to have the decision overturned. Multiple appeals, trials over the years, some even up to their death were trying to get back in. Uh, new evidence, though, in recent years has come to light at times to try and that's actually working towards benefiting those players, such as in the case of my heroes, Shoeless Joe Jackson, um, who had the most recent ones that I know of. One fact of this is that Shoeless Joe was known to be somewhat illiterate. He couldn't read. So how could he know what he signed when they had him sign the confession? Unless somebody told him that, oh, this is the confession, and you are admitting that you did this, this, and that. He had to understand and know what he was signing in order for it to be legal. Also, the lawyer during the trial and that, that got the player, I man, got Shields Joe to sign his confession was the team lawyer. And the interest of a team lawyer is to look out for the team, not the player or individuals involved. So he could have thrown the entire eight men squad in the ground just to save that. And just to save his, just to save the Chicago White Sox club and help them. Now, Joe, also something that was brought up is that Sheila Show was said to be drunk when he signed the confession. Which means he would not have known what he was signing or understood what he was signing. Therefore, again, fairly certain that makes it and that makes it not possible to be signed. I mean, not able to be used in court. Makes it invalid. Um, and, and okay, and also in a final note, rumors that stem from rumors. About this, there's at least one player that is said to have under an alias would go on to play in other leagues. And that includes, well, I'm sorry, two. Uh, one was a friend, was the best friend of Shoeless Joe, and the other was Shoeless Joe himself, or both said under aliases to have gone on to play in other leagues outside of the Major League Baseball. So what's the biggest urban legend in sports that you like? Also, I mean, leave that in the comment as well as what you'd like for me to do in an upcoming video topic. Till next time.